Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the GMI Rocket Show. Today is episode number 46. I'm your host, Roman Zelichenko. I'm a former immigration attorney turned immigration tech entrepreneur. Uh, I'm the founder of Laborless, which automates H-1B visa compliance, and also the founder of GMI Rocket, um, which brings you the show and is a digital marketing agency focused specifically on the immigration and global mobility industry, which is, by the way, what GMI stands for. Um, I'm really excited today, episode number 46, as we get closer to the year since this podcast launched, I think I'm going to continue being reflecting on it and saying how crazy it is that this podcast, this show has been going on uh, for, for so long. Um, but today's a really special episode. Um, we have uh, Ron Matten, who is an immigration attorney, um, but really one of the most entrepreneurial immigration attorneys I think I've ever met. Um, Ron is a former engineer uh, who spent a number of years working as an actual engineer before turning to law school and sort of pursuing a career in, in law and in immigration law, um, working at a, a number of firms uh, before more recently launching his own. Um, but I think what's really unique is that the law firm that he has launched, Matt and Law, um, is incredibly tech savvy. I mean, it is basically a startup in and of itself. And I think what's going to be really interesting is to hear about sort of how Ron has um, taken uh, this technology that he's found and not only applied it to his law firm, uh, but also um, what his tips are and recommendations are for other immigration lawyers in terms of, you know, how do you leverage technology in a way to make your firm run well and efficiently and um, have you enjoy work. So without further ado, uh, Ron, thank you so much for being here and for joining. And I'm super excited to dive more into your life um, and of course, get some really awesome tips and thoughts from you from a tech perspective. Well, thanks, Roman. I'm glad to be here. And uh, I have to confess, I feel more nervous doing this than any of the last probably 20 things that I've presented on. <laughs> it is. Yeah. When we talk about ourselves in our lives, sometimes it's like, you know, it's the easiest story to tell because it's our story. Uh, but of course, um, all eyes on you. But you know what? If you're so, if you've been presenting so many so many times, I mean, we've been on panels together, and um, I think people are going to be really interested. I'm certainly really interested to hear about what makes you tick and why you chose the path that you chose, and of course, what people can learn from it. Cool. Um, one thing I want to say for folks watching: tell us where you're watching from. Give yourself a shout out. Leave a comment. Um, I love doing this live because we can actually interact with, uh, you know, with the people who are watching and tuning in. So ask Ron questions. I mean, if you're going to have an opportunity to ask someone questions, this is it to say like, what about this? How do you feel about that technology for my law firm? What is it all about? Um, so please do go ahead and ask questions and leave the comments and I'll bring them up and we'll talk about it. Um, so, so Ron, you know, as usual, I think, in many podcasts and many shows, people tend to gloss over sort of a person's background. You know, you went to law school here, you started work here. What are you doing now? To me, that is the most fascinating part yeah. of someone's story. Um, yeah. I know you've lived in both the U.S. and Canada. I, I know you've had like this really kind of colorful uh, career. Um, what's really fascinating is that you were an engineer first and foremost. That's what you went to undergrad and grad school for. You worked and then you went back to, to school to pursue your JD. Um, but if we go further back before college, you know, I want to learn about, you know, who was Ron Matten sort of as a kid? Were you a tinkerer? Did you like take things apart and rebuild them? You know, did you have this sort of engineering mindset from, uh, from childhood? Absolutely not. Uh, I am probably the least hands-on engineer that you'll meet. Uh, what I was always really good at was math. And so I studied engineering just because I was good at math. But um, I remember, it's funny that you started here because I wasn't, like, I haven't prepared anything for today. Um, uh, it was only when you mentioned that the video of this is going to be immediately available that then I wanted to go grab a drink. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was planning to be all vulnerable and authentic, so uh, hopefully, I hopefully I can stay on on that theme. Definitely. But but uh, I actually, you know, what's funny is I actually did a LinkedIn post about this person that I'm going to talk about, and it, probably most people missed it, but because it was like it was not my most uh, artful LinkedIn post, it was just a text post, and it was kind of toward the beginning of the pandemic, and I don't know if you went through this where. 
there was sort of this period where I would say a lot of us just really got focused on being grateful and expressing gratitude. There was just such a like groundswell of support, community building. I, I feel like like you you've been certainly part of that for my circle, but I think a lot of people found like their tribe during COVID. Um, and I was just really in this period of like wanting to thank people from my past. And there was this guy that was one of my early mentors when I worked at Motorola. And he was this, he was he was the quintessential engineer. So he had um, so this was back in the 90s. And he had a VW bug from like 1972 or something. And <clears throat> so the original bug, the original beetle, not the new one. Mm -hmm. And on his, there was, there was like the way the office was set up. This was like sort of early days of cubicles. There was four of us that shared this area and on his bulletin board, he had this little thing. And I just, I always found it fascinating and hysterical that it was, it was called uh beetle repair kit and it was just like one of the what do they call those like a blister pack and inside the blister pack was a rubber band and that was the Vita, that was the beetle repair kit and I, I forget we were talking about something one day i think i had to change the brakes in my car and and, his, and this guy's name is charlie and charlie said to me like oh well, you should just do it yourself like why do you want to spend the money taking it to a shop and i i was like horrified like how am i going to do this myself i don't know anything about it and he said to me like he basically said what what kind of engineer are you that you don't know how to fix things yourself so um i think i think i was never destined to be an engineer for super long because that's not that's not really what makes me tick but i do think that the uh I, the, the work that i did was really focused on um setting up uh assembly lines and process flows hmm. and that part of it shockingly has become such a core part to doing immigration law because as you know from your time working at an immigration law firm um it's it like what we do is not the most like artful type of lawyering it's a lot of it is like do you have all the right components are they in the right order did you file the LCA six months in advance? It's it's all super procedural, and your your practice has to have these processes to make things work. So I just went all over the place with that answer, but I don't know if that helps. No, definitely. So I mean, it's 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 funny. You so you started off as a math major or somebody really interested yeah. in math. Um, I, I definitely, I, as I get older, I also recognize how important actually at least learning, you don't have to be a math savant, but at least learning and really start studying math as a, as a younger person is important because it teaches you abstract thinking. It teaches you pattern recognition. And I think that's so important in life. I mean, you know, in anything from, a, you know, legal uh, practice. And I think they said, I think I remember when I was taking the LSAT, some statistics said that like engineering majors statistically do best on the LSAT. And I was like, what do you mean? I thought it would be an English or a philosophy major. They do pretty well too, but engineers did the best because there's a lot of logical thinking and math tends to be very logical in structure. Um, so, I, you know, I, I think it just makes sense. My curiosity would be, you know, okay, so you were good in math. Um, obviously you, you ended up pursuing engineering when you were uh, in college and then you went to grad school for it. Was it sort of a career choice where you're like, okay, well, I, I'm good at math. This is practical. It's a practical application of math. Let me pursue engineering. Or did you have like pa family pressure sort of to say, hey, you should be an engineer. I'm just, I'm curious how that started because clearly you didn't end up there. Although you still, of course, yeah. work with engineers. Um, okay, so so let, let me take you a little bit further back. So uh, I'm the youngest of four kids and um, my dad was a professor and my mom was a nurse, but a nurse who focused on patient education. And so I grew up in this household where basically both of my parents were teachers. Um, and the other thing that was really, uh, I I'm basically never gonna answer any of your questions directly. Just be, you, you probably know that about me already. So, um, but one of the things that I would say is probably the most influential aspect of where I am today is that um, my dad used to always host uh, professors that would come visit the US. So they would come for a conference or some sort of exchange. And 
we would always have these people staying at our house um, from different countries. And actually, even before that, when I was three, my dad went on sabbatical to Wales and our family moved there for a year. And so this like this idea of a of like an interconnected planet is something that it's not even something I'm conscious of. It's just it's just normal to me. It's normal to me that if somebody is the best at something and they live in Egypt, then that person should be able to work at the business that needs their talent. And so that, like the idea of borders is so clear to me that it's an artificial human construct. It's not like maps. I love maps, by the way, but like try to find like where there's, you know, try to find the border between the US and Canada. It's just like a tree over there is Canadian and a tree over here is American, right? Like next to your cabin probably. Um, <laughs> So, so, uh, but one of the people that um, that my family got to know when my dad was even earlier, before I was born, uh, when my dad was doing his PhD, there was a there was a foreign student from France that uh, was my parents' next door neighbor, and so my brother and sister, and then this family's oldest children were the same age. We became friends. And it's however many, many years later, uh, I won't tell you how old I am, but um, or I don't care really. But um, anyway, like our families have stayed friends, like we've been to the weddings of each other's, uh, of each other as well as each other's kids. And um, when I was in university, I, everyone, every one of my siblings and every one of the, the children of this family had spent at least part of a summer with the other family. Um, and so I was the last one and I hadn't done it yet. And so being the one like, you know, being the baby in the family, I have, I have the, I have many benefits because it's like all the lessons that my parents had to learn with the older siblings they already knew they could see the light at the end of the tunnel financially. Um, so when I was in university, uh, I had the opportunity to go do an internship in France for, it turned out that this guy that used to be my parents' uh, neighbor was CEO of a chemical company. Um, so he got me, a, he got me an internship to work on, um, uh, what do you, I forgot the name of it now, process improvement, continuous process, whatever, some industrial engineering term uh, at this chemical factory. And so I got this internship and um, and it was great. It's like they were gonna they were gonna provide me with a place to live, and I was gonna get paid something. I was gonna get school credit. Um, perfect, right? And uh, I did it this the winter spring semester. So um, I remember my family went on vacation for Christmas in Florida. Not Christmas because I'm Jewish. So that time of year though. And I went and I went directly from Florida to France and, you know, I was 20 years old and got on the plane and arrived in France, got picked up at the airport, spent a nice couple of days with the, the, um, the, the people that were our, our friends. And then, and then somebody drove, I don't even remember, somebody drove me to this little town that's about an hour to the east of Paris where this chemical factory was. And everything was fine except for the fact that like my six years of studying French led like completely different when people are talking to you quickly. Um, so the first month was hard. And then there was this point at around, I, I don't know, like around the end of the first month where I got called into the, like the administration office and they said, um, you're going to see where this story is going very soon. Uh, and they said to me, um, can we see your work permit? And I, I was, I was 20 years old. So if there's any other immigration uh, lawyers out there or mobility people who work with young people in undergrad, like we all are stupid. So like if one of those young, if one of those young clients asks you something, you're like, how did this person not know that? Like we've all been there. I had no clue. I had zero clue. You know, it's like, here's my passport. I gave them my passport. And they're like, no, that's not a work permit. <laughs> um, I can't believe I'm like 
announcing this, I'll probably be banned from France forever once this <laughs> airs. Um, but it literally took the entire time of my internship to get that straightened out. Um, and it did finally get straightened out. But uh, I, that, that sort of experience, the, it, it stuck with me in a number of different ways, because I would say whenever I, whenever I deal with a client who doesn't seem to understand the concept of work permission and visas, especially I would say from the from Europe, Canada, US, like in particular, there's this sense of entitlement of like, oh, I can just go. It's those other people that need to get a work visa. I'm, I've had that conversation, unfortunately, too many times. Um, it's my own experience that I am not able to judge them because I know like it's sort of ingrained in us, I would say, especially as Americans, we, we have this, we want to believe that like, of course, somebody should welcome us to their country because they're going to, they're going to learn so much from me because just because I'm American, just because I was, I've grown up in this society that is democratic and freedom, et cetera, which mm -hmm. maybe has come into question this year. I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, it's also interesting that like throughout <clears throat> throughout your sort of life at, up until this point, because keep in mind, you're still in college here. So you're still geared towards, I guess, being an engineer. But yeah. immigration is sort of touching you in multiple different ways. First, with this sort of international presence of professors in your home and, you know, wh who your dad was inviting. And then now sort of your own experience, right, of being an immigrant somewhere else for some period of time or, you know, a short term yeah. visitor. Yeah. That was, that was, uh, I mean, I don't remember, I was too young to remember when we went to Wales, but th that was sort of my first immigration experience. And then, as you know, I later immigrated to Canada. Um, I don't know if we're ready to go there quite yet. I feel like. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. So that was of course for yeah. your, um, you know, as an attorney, but before we do that, you know, before we get jump into that, um, you came back, I mean, you had some experience, I suppose, in France, mm -hmm. you came back, um, you, you did grad school directly after undergrad, right? So you kind of just went to, for the yeah. masters. Um, and then, so, and then like you mentioned, you worked in Motorola for, I think I saw four, five or so years. Yeah. Um, w you know, you eventually switched careers, but I'm curious, you know, what did you learn? What do you remember from your time working as an engineer that you think, you know, you kind of touched on it earlier, but you think really kind of stuck with you, um, and maybe made you who you are today as a, as a professional. <clears throat> so long ago, Roman. Um, uh, I, I think mainly what stuck with me is that that was my, that was really my first exposure to corporate America. Um, and, it, I, you know, I, I sort of knew this was going to happen, that you're going to ask me things and I was going to, things were going to occur to me that I wasn't even aware of. So that was where I found out that, um, I found out about professional development, promotions, titles, these were things that were not in my conscious mind. They were not like, it was like, I went to school, I, I, I knew about grades, like I knew the positive reinforcement of getting good grades and what that was all about. But then it's like, when I had a job, I thought, you know, whatever my starting salary was back then, I thought it was like rich, you know? Um, and I didn't think about anything else, you know? I, I went in, I did the work. I, I, I had no appreciation whatsoever for whether what the, the work I was doing, was it like generating enough revenue based on what I was getting paid? Like none of that was in my awareness. And, and I really didn't do very well the first couple of years. Like I wasn't even aware of it. I just, I, like I knew, I. In my mind, it was all still very much about like knowing the formulas or the methods and how to study for an exam and take an exam. And in the real world, you know, it's more about persuasion and getting people to help you. And um, like fundamentally in these big corporate environments, like your impact, you only see this little, you know, grain in the sea of the silo, right? It's it's mm -hmm. like, and and um, it was only a couple of years later that the group that I was in 
uh, they were moving the production facility from Chicago area to Dallas. So it's like that was the first cost saving move to go from Chicago, which was relatively expensive compared to, to Dallas. Later, of course, most of that got moved overseas. But when that happened, um, there was this opportunity to, I mean, it was great. Like at the time, it's like they were going to pay, I forget how much money to help you make a down payment on a house and pay your, all your relocation. And it was one of those deals that like, it seemed really sweet. But then my family was like, you can't move to Texas. And so I didn't take it. Um, and they did help the people that at least most of the people that didn't take it, they helped us find jobs at other locations in, in Chicago area. Um, and so I ended up in this new group after I had already been with Motorola for a couple of years. And, and the new group that I was in was much younger. So the, the first group that I was in, there weren't really that many young people. And so I didn't really have too many friends at work. I was kind of like, like I say, I was unaware because I just had no one to compare to. And then I ended up at this other group where the demographic was almost all the same as me. In fact, some people that I graduated with. Um, and that was when I found out that I was making so much less money than everybody else. And that everybody else had like, they, there was like this, almost like a government grade, you know, there's like E6, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Like I, I was level 56 and everybody else was 57 and 58. And all of a sudden it's like, it's like that old Dr. Seuss book where like suddenly somebody points out that the person over there has a spot on them and you're like, where's my spot? Mm -hmm. And, um, and then all of a sudden I wanted that. It's like, I want the promotion. I want more money. But before that, I was kind of blissfully unaware. And all I really was thinking about was, did I like the work that I was doing? So mm -hmm. do you yeah. think, I mean, it, 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 do, which one do you think, I suppose they're both, especially in a larger corporate environment, um, they go hand in hand, but <clears throat> I don't know, which one do you think is more important? Because I, I feel like the first instinct of yours, which was to do the work for the sake of doing good work, should be the thing that drives yeah. us. It should yeah. be the company's responsibility to notice when we do that and then give us some sort of a promotion or whatever it might be, encouragement. But of course, sometimes you need to actually have that competitive edge where you're like, wait a minute, that person has this thing. Like, let me m push further. So, so I think um, there's so many things I could say about that, but I think the biggest challenge is that I think that the, the overwhelming majority of people that are managers are terrible at being managers. And um, when I look back on the people in, that have shaped uh, my professional growth, it's really like when I think about the people who helped me, those are the people that I emulate today. And these are people who made it their their main part of their day was to become the champion of the person that reported to them. You know, it's it's like that feeling that if this person doesn't succeed, it's on me, not on them, right? And um, unfortunately, there's just not a lot of people like that. And, and I would say later in my career, uh, when I was a lawyer working at bigger uh, organizations, um, I think lawyers are even worse than engineers in terms of, in terms of like that power struggle. Um, I think there's probably a higher percentage of engineers that are happier just doing their thing. Um, in law firms, it feels like there's a lot of lawyers who have no desire to be a lawyer. They just, they want the title, the money, the big office, the perks. Um, so anyway, let me, well, there. <laughs> no, I, 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 and I want to get to a, kind of that reflection a little bit um, down the road. So, you know, you worked as an engineer. I'm curious, what made you eventually want to go to law school? Uh, because I think this is where your sort of current journey really starts. Yeah. So, um, the, the, this is probably going to surprise you as an answer, but it actually was part of my coming out journey. Um, so, um, let's see, I got my, I, I, I uh, started working full time in 1992 and my mom actually passed away in 1995 after, after a long battle with leukemia. And it was sort of like, that was one of those moments where things that I hadn't, you know, I, I guess I, I didn't come out 
until like late in my 20s. And part of it was, I think, sort of that that moment when my mom passed away that it's like, okay, you know, enough sort of trying to please everybody else. Like I need to live my life for myself because my mom died quite young. Um, and, and I, and it, you know, it, it sort of shook me up in a way that I haven't really even verbalized it like that until just now, but that was when I, that was when I started to put, I think my own personal goals, uh, closer to the front, I think up into that point, the reason I mentioned so many times that I'm the youngest of four is that I really, to a great extent, just followed the path of my older siblings. Um, and it was only sort of in the mid nineties that then I was like, kind of screw this. It's time for me to enjoy my own life and find out what I'm actually passionate about. So it was, it was like, I was sort of, frankly like sort of trapped in this not trapped exactly but i was in this suburban like white straight christian life that i was like this is not me this is not who i am and on the work side of it it's like i i was doing okay at what i was doing but um i i knew that i couldn't keep just ha being in this little tiny box. Because the thing about these big organizations and where you're an engineer is like, you're given a very discreet project. Um, so it's like, figure out how to improve the cost of like one particular manufacturing process, the flux wave something machine. Um, and and it's, you know, it, I, it didn't engage me. You know, I yeah. wanted to be able I, I didn't even know who the customers were. Like I literally had no idea who was buying this stuff. So um, because we weren't doing the handsets, the cell phone handsets, we were building the infrastructure equipment, which, you know, it's, it's just, I felt too far removed from like the, what I was doing to how it was helping anybody. Mm -hmm. And so somehow that led to me going to law school. Oh, one other thing. Plus, plus, so my dad, um, he retired from being a professor after 35 years. He was, I don't know, 60 something. Um, and part of his retirement agreement was that he got the university to pay for his law school at the university. So he was, he was not a professor in law. He was a professor in paleobotany. So foss plant fossils. And um, so he had done that 30 something years and then he said, okay, I'm going to retire. Will you pay the law school tuition? The, you know, it didn't cost the university anything to do that. So they said yes. And so he started law school and that was sort of the final thing. I was like, oh, maybe I should go to law school too. And so we were actually in law school at the same time. He graduated, wow. a, year, he graduated a year before me. That's fascinating. One question I have, what did your siblings do professionally? Were they also engineers or anything related to what you were doing? So my brother is is a electrical engineer still at uh, I, it was originally AT and T I think now it's part of IBM maybe I don't know it's gone through a number of acquisitions mm -hmm. he's so all of my siblings have been in their their same profession their whole career so my brother's a electrical same same profession same employer so my brother's electrical engineer for 30 something years. My sister is a scientist at the EPA. Uh, she's been there for even more. And then my other sister is a elementary school teacher um, outside of Chicago. Um, so I'm the only, I'm the, I'm the problem child. I've changed my <laughs> career. I've moved a whole bunch of times. Um, and and did you, I mean, how cool is it too to, to watch your dad after an entire career and literally retiring to then go back to school? I, I'm just curious about that for a moment. Did he want to actually practice law? Like, did he want to have a second career or was it sort of like an intellectual exercise where it's like, okay, well, it's free. I might as well. No, no, no. He, he practiced. So he graduated, let's see, he was 62 when he graduated law school, and then he took a job with a firm outside of Denver that did elder law, so like trusts, and I'm not even sure exactly what. Um, 
he was able to get them to so that he didn't have to work full time. Um, but he didn't care. Like, I, I would say that's probably the biggest influence on me is that my dad has never had money has never been his primary driver. Like he didn't he didn't they could have paid him nothing. He just wanted to be able to do it. And he got so into it. Um, after that, like, I think he worked there till he was about 70. Um, and every time there's a family get together, like he would, he just would get so into telling us the stories of like, it's all these crazy stories, like these families that the, the patriarch or matriarch dies. And then the siblings like kill each other fighting over the value of like a $150,000 house. And they end up so that it has to be a forced sale and each kid ends up getting nothing because they've like squandered all the money on lawyers and probate and whatever. Anyway, he would tell us all these, I mean, there were, my dad's a good storyteller. Let's just say that. And so that influenced you a little bit. I mean, obviously you were there in law school at the same time. Uh, but it sounds like his sort of philosophy on kind of life, I guess, influenced you a bit too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, he did not. He did not ever pursue any sort of entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, uh, anything, um, which is probably why for me it took a long time to get there. Like I said, like both of my parents, my three siblings, they all had the same employer their whole professional career. Um, I think I've always tried to do things a little bit differently, um, but. Uh, um, so, somehow my dad's a little bit entrepreneurial, but not in a business way. Like he's, he's 82 and he's still like, he's teaching, I don't know. I can't even keep up with him. He teaches a class <laughs> on like, he teaches some sort of class on like Phil. I don't know. He was for a while. He was teaching a class on like comparative theories to evolution. And it's like sounded fascinating. Cause there's like, you know, we, we hear about, this is like total tangent. So the, the big controversy in the U S right. It's like evolution versus creationism, right? Like sort of the cultural, cultural argument, but there's all kinds of other theories out there. And like one of the ones, I mean, it's just, there's like funny stuff out there. There's just, there's like a belief in the great spaghetti monster. And that that's yeah. like, instead of the big bang theory, there was this big spaghetti monster that created all the planets or something. Anyway, my point is, is that like my dad doesn't stop. Like he's he's always interested in teaching, and like in that sense, he's entrepreneurial. Like he'll seek out and create opportunities, but it's never it's never because of the money. It's just because he likes doing it. And I That's think awesome. and I think I've I've taken on that. So how did you fall into the immigration world? Um, so when you graduated law school, you've obviously had these experiences, but it, you know, it doesn't sound like you necessarily were going to school to be an immigration lawyer. How did you come across, you know, the practice? So believe it or not, I did like that. Actually, it was my law school admission exam, uh, sorry, essay was that story about, uh, what happened to me in France and, um, and so I, I joked with you on LinkedIn about like, this is your 46th episode and Joe Biden is the 46th president. And then you were saying I'm going to run for president. But actually when I applied to law school, I mean, again, like I have this, this common thread of being incredibly naive. So I was 28 years old or something when I applied to law school. And I remember talking to my aunt and she was asking me, why do I want to go to law school? And dead serious. I looked her in the eye and said, I want to be on the Supreme Court and like completely clueless about how, how um, political it is to be on the Supreme Court and how like your pedigree. Well, I don't know. Trump maybe pick some people that their pedigree doesn't add up, but generally speaking, like you, like the pedigree of almost all the Supreme Court justices, they all, it's they're all pretty similar if you look at them they all went to like one of a handful of top law schools they all clerked for a judge there there's like there's certain hallmarks of things that you have to do anyway my aunt laughed at me and uh but i but throughout law school i i had this 
passion to, to make a difference, right? It's that idealism that I think a lot of us go to law school for. Um, but I did know that I was interested in immigration, partly I would say from, from like this experience with the people I saw my dad have come visit us, partly from my experience as an engineer. Oh, I skipped over a step where I worked as a consultant. So I had like a Canadian TN to be a management consultant um, right before I went to law school. And I just, to me, it was like, I've always just had this belief um, that the, the right person for the job is the one who should get the job. It shouldn't be based on, it shouldn't, uh, clearly it shouldn't be based on race, gender, religion, but I don't even think it should be based on immigration status. It's like, we're in an extremely competitive world and we need to have the top minds on the top projects and it shouldn't be based on sort of the geographical fortune of where, you know, the hospital where you were born. Right. Um, I actually found a really like kindred spirit in this philosophy when I was at, um, uh, well, it's now called EY Law, part of Ernst & Young. Uh, the practice leader, his name is James Egan, amazing guy. And he he's, so he's Canadian. So this was part of, uh, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but this was part of my time in Canada. And I was always doing U.S. immigration uh, the whole time I was in Canada, but our practice did both U.S. and Canadian. And And I can't remember why this conversation came up, but there was like one side of the border or the other was tightening things. It might've been, it might've been like during the financial downturn back in 2009. And, and I remember I said something to James, like, you know, James, like, how do you feel about the fact that, that our U S business might go down, but the Canadian immigration business might go up. Right. It's like, luckily we did both. So, so there could be benefit to one side, if not the other. And, his answer to me, it was like, it was so obvious, but I hadn't really thought about it that way is he just, he said to me, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a nationalist. I'm doing this because I believe in the movement of people. So the more movement of people, the better. And that's just like, that's just the foundational philosophy is just like, we should all be about movement, free movement of people, not necessarily totally open borders, but there should be you know, like I say, get the top talent to the right location. I love it. I think a lot of people in the industry would probably agree with that um, across the board, uh, mm -hmm. especially to your point now in this really competitive environment. Um, I wanted to take one quick pause. Uh, just this is from a little while ago, but uh, Marco, Marco uh, saying, hey, um, <laughs> here to learn from you. Um, Syed joining from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, Sheen Pueblos uh, from USCES uh, saying hello. So hi, Sheen and Elena from Maryland, which is awesome. And then, of course, Shiv, uh, always yeah. always joining. Appreciate your support, as always, Shiv um, from Atlanta, unless you're on vacation. Um, so I just want to say uh, thank you to everyone who's so far commented and, and uh you know, said said hello where they're where they're calling in from. Um, so I, I know you kind of jumped around a little bit, um, but you know we can kind of skip ahead a bit. You, you we went to uh, you went to to law school. You you wanted to go in part because of your immigration experience. Clearly, that had an impact on you. You graduated, and I guess you got a job in the immigration industry. But you you worked in in, a, in a, at a firm in California, if I if I understood that correctly, right? Um, so. You you you, t you jumped around a bit. You were at a bunch of bigger firms, right? You were um, at EY. You were in Canada for a while. Um, I was curious, like during that time, because I do want to get to when you launched your firm. But during the time where you, where you were working for sort of multiple immigration law firms, yeah. whether you started small and then you ended up going big, um, what was that journey like for you? Were you trying to move up because you made partner at some of these big firms? Um, so clearly, you know, comparing to what you were talking about at Motorola, you know, you, you, you were moving up actually this time around. Right. Um, so I don't know. Can you talk a little bit about that? I drank the Kool-Aid, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, for, first of all, I don't, I don't, you know, um, it's worth, it is worth noting that, uh, two very important things happened, uh, while I was in law school and right after I finished law school. So. Um, while I was in law school, I met my now husband, who's from Peru. 
Um, and the other thing that happened is that I graduated law school in 2001. And every, you know, it's like any of us that were alive back then, it's sort of like your, the way that you think about pre COVID versus today, it's like the world has changed, right? The world before, before 9-11 was in many respects when I, I mean, now it's 20 years later, but when I think back on it, it was, it was a much more innocent place. Um, and so I graduated, studied for the bar exam. I had no job, but I heard, but like my classmates that had jobs at big firms already lined up. I, I oh, where are you going on your bar, uh, your post bar vacation? And, um, and I thought I got to get in on that. So um, I took the bar exam in July and, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go take my post bar vacation to Peru and South America. And so I decided to spend two months in South America. And that, you know, when I get back, I'll find a job. Like nobody wants to hire me before they know my bar results. Anyway, there was all sorts of ration rationalization in my mind about why somebody with no income could afford to do this. Um, so um, I hope my dad's not watching this because uh, he's the one that paid for it all. Um, <laughs> Thanks, so, Dad. <laughs> exactly. Father's Day was on Sunday. Uh, I owe you. Um, so, uh, so bar exam, of course, end of July. I got on the plane like the next day, arrived in Peru, July 31st, something like that. And after spending a month studying Spanish all day. Um, then my husband and I, well, he wasn't my husband yet. We, we traveled around, we went to Chile, we went to Argentina and we were in Buenos Aires on nine 11. And my flight to go back to California was a week after that. And wow. suddenly, suddenly, you know, it's like the entire world changed. I didn't know if I was going to be able, to, I don't know if you remember this, but like there were no flights at all, like worldwide, there were no flights for, I don't know how long, a few days. Um, <clears throat> we actually flew on September 12th from Buenos Aires to Lima. And I have this very, it's, it's kind of, a, it's a stupid, embarrassing story, but um, the on the flight, there the guy sitting next to me wouldn't get off his cell phone before the plane uh, left and they kept announcing. And I, I was like, I started yelling at him. I was like, sir, you have to turn it off. Like, didn't you see what happened yesterday? It was like one of those, um, you know, I think we were all sort of having that shock and, and grieving and all the rest. Um, so when I got back to the US, I didn't have a job and nobody was hiring. So it took me, you know, in retrospect, it wasn't that long, but it took me about um, until January till I had my first actual job. I, I found some like, little projects but um my first immigration job or my first full-time immigration job was at a small law firm in koreatown in los angeles and we did a little bit of everything and i i like i owe so much to the two partners at that firm mike and tom because it was not a firm that was overly focused on like making loads of money they really were in it for doing the right thing for helping people and both those guys were amazing amazingly knowledgeable at what they did and this guy tom i remember i would walk into his office and i'd be like oh um can you explain to me like unlawful presence and he would like you know this is 20 years ago so you have to picture the it was not paperless at all he'd like get up walk over to his file cabinet open the drawer and almost like without looking like reach in and pull out he's like oh here's the paleo memo you should read it and he had this like encyclopedic knowledge not just of what the law was today but the context like what it was before what why things got changed and I was able to work on a little bit of business immigration, a little bit of family and some removal. And I think it was that that early experience that really gave me the foundation that allowed me to do a lot of the things that I've been doing throughout the rest of my career. So I think your question was like, at some point I decided that I wanted to get the big name and the big salary and all that. Um, 
I, I, I think, I, I think um, th this is where like, I don't know if it's just a, a function of getting older or the culture of where I was working, but it was very much, um, you know, as a lawyer, your value is, is based on the results that you're getting and whether you're, frankly, like whether your clients are coming back to you. And um, I think I just, I, the competitiveness part of me, I wanted to feel like I was getting recognized. So then it became more of a focus of mine to, to try to move up. Mm -hmm. And you did that, I suppose. I mean, you moved around, of course. You were, you were building book of business and kind of were you thinking a little bit entrepreneurially while you were inside these bigger firms? Because, I mean, you know, as a partner, to your point, if you have to bring in business, you sort of have to do some of the marketing and the sales on your own. The, the book of business question is a great one because I think um, anybody who's who's ha is thinking about these things, um, People were telling me like, oh, you have to have, you have to protect the client relationships. You have to have a book of business. One of the challenges at the big firms, especially I would say in the, the ones connected to the accounting firms is that it's, it's like, there are so many people that own those, those big corporate relationships. It's not like one person owns that. Um, and to be honest, I have, I had no book. Um, uh, when I was, when I was part of the, part of why I moved around and may as well just get this out in the open. So I was at, I mean, it's all on my LinkedIn profile anyway. So I was at EY and then I moved from Toronto to Taft Polskin Smith in San Francisco, worked there for a year. Then I moved back to Toronto. I had a short stint at a firm and then ey was like oh you're back in toronto you should come back here we'll make you partner and then i was there for a couple of years but then i wanted to move back to the us again and i went back to taft polsky and smith again and they made me partner um and then we wanted to move back to canada again and so there was there was sort of like dueling stories of like where we wanted to live as a couple as a family and what I wanted to do professionally. And the interesting thing about the back and forth between those two firms is that um, the reason that they both were willing to hire me to some respect is that they both service the same corporate client. So it was a corporate client that used multiple outside law firms. Mm -hmm. and, they, and so they knew, like they both knew what I was capable of. They knew how much the client valued me. And I have to confess, maybe for the first time publicly, that the I thought my value to the client was a lot more than what I found out it was. And that's probably been one of the most humbling aspects out of the journey to start my own firm is this realization that um, you might have a champion at a client. So if it's a corporate client, you might have a champion. You might have multiple champions. But the ability to actually like own a big corporate account relationship is about so much more than whether somebody thinks you're a good lawyer. It's, it's, uh, you know, th there's big money and big responsibility and stakeholders and shareholders and board of directors that, uh, people aren't going to just be willing to hire me to, to work on their big corporate account if I don't have some sort of bigger structure, global structure. I know that this is a common topic of uh, my friend Ken Nickel Lane, but um, our friend. Uh, but um, I, I, I will say like more than anything that I had an inflated sense of what I was worth based on the quality of the work I was doing. And I totally missed the boat on the importance of the client relationship and the sales aspect. And I was pretty good at selling, but not as a like, you know, when, when you're in the big four, the number of like, you're constantly getting opportunities. I mean, th mm -hmm. those big accounting firms, they have somebody in the door at every big company globally. And they, their mission, if you're a partner at one of those firms, the mission is to sell, 
the service of another service area, right? It's like, if you're not doing that, you're not actually doing your job. So we had just a constant flow of inquiries of prospective clients, of corporate clients that wanted to expand to the US. Um, and especially at EY, I really was able to develop some amazing skill at understanding how to handle that, the economics of it. Um, I mean, the managing partner there is just this phenomenal guy who really helped. You know, I mentioned some of these points when we had our panel at AILA last week, but um, really he's the one that got me. So like, I can think about a case, not just in terms of uh, the, the flat fee that might be on the fee chart, but what's the number of hours that it's gonna take to deliver it? What's the number of hours it's gonna take me? The number of hours it's gonna take a paralegal assistant? Because fundamentally, like that math, and this is maybe where my strength in math comes in, because I almost do it without even having to put pen to paper. The ability to price your work uh, so that you can actually make it, deliver it profitably, um, that's, that's a key. So I think I've always been really good operationally, really good at client service. I think that's why multiple firms were interested in hiring me at, at these positions, but it's it's only been since I started my own firm that I've had to really experience the ups and downs of the hustle of, of getting my own clients. What I think is really interesting about this is the idea that um, now as a law firm founder and as somebody who talks about sort of technology and automation within a law firm, it, it sounds like this opportunity to think through like what's the unit economics basically of the work that you do in the law firm context, even in a flat fee context is effectively, or I guess in part, at least the foundation of how you run your business now. Right. Yeah. Um, because it's not just you, there's a lot more you can toggle than the fees. You can toggle the technology that you use. You can toggle how quickly or how slowly um, you, you complete an application. You can toggle how many people touch it. Do you need 10 people to touch it or can you maybe just have two people touch it and the rest is done through technology? So I guess my, you know, my, my question would be then, all right, now you've, you've, you've had all these experiences, you're launching your firm, right? Um, you launched it as far as I know from day one as a very tech savvy firm, right? Your, your tech yeah. stack quote unquote is on your website. So people mm -hmm. know when I work with Matt and law, I'm going to work with probably, or I'm going to work with somebody that uses one, two, three, four, five tools. Mm -hmm. um, how did how did that happen? And sort of how has it been so far now that you've started it that way? Yeah. Um, I think uh, um, a, a number of influences, let's say. Um, part of it was when when I when I left the, the firm I was at, um, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew what I was really good at. And I was really good at managing these high volume programs. Like I knew the law really well, but a lot of why, a lot of what my, the value I brought was also the people management and the, like the operational management. Because when you have over a thousand open perms that you're working on for one client, there's you have to be able to know what's happening with each one of those in its split second like if your data doesn't allow you to do that you don't have the time to like dig into it you have to be able to to have your data set up um and i think actually shiv is like one of my he's one of my uh what do you call those like spiritual brothers in in this perm perm data battle but um we never worked together. I just, I just know a lot about him. But um, uh, so, I, I knew all about like the perm process. I knew all about the visa bulletin and how to like, how to really like advise people on like what their options were, the timing, how they should be thinking about it, um, whether their kids were going to age out before they could get the green card, all this stuff, and. So when I when I started the firm, um, I just I just was like, how like I thought that I was going to continue to serve those big corporate clients, but I was I was always trying to figure out like how could I do it 
in a way that somebody would hire me as like a solo. And, and now we, I have a team and the firm's gotten bigger, but at the time it was just me. And, um, and so I just, like, I knew the type of tools that these bigger firms were using. I knew the type of technology solutions they were offering to their clients. And I just decided from the beginning that I needed to be able to offer at least the same if I wanted to have any shot at all of being hired by, by these corporate clients. And what I found out really quickly is that um, it, the immigration world lives in a, like a, they have tunnel vision. And so for the longest time, there really were three providers that all the big uh, business immigration law firms would use for case management. Um, and, and when I started my own firm, I was like, they're, they're those three, but every firm I've been at hated all three of them. And so I was like, what else is out there that I could use? And that was when I learned I would say the groundbreaking moment was when I learned about Clio because that was when I began to realize that there's a whole world of legal technology out there that most immigration practitioners don't know about. Most of them are so focused on preparing forms and on uh, intake questionnaires that they, there's like this whole universe of tools out there that you don't have to implement them all, but you should be, you should be, learning about them. You should be thinking about like, why would somebody want to do document automation? What is document automation? What's a CRM? What's a chatbot for? Like, you know, it's not just, it's not, you know, if all these companies have a chatbot, it can't be that it's just like the annoying type of chatbot that we've all experienced. There's got to be a real purpose for it. And so like, um, I just, I don't know, I, I guess I had more time. And so I just started networking and reaching out to people. And uh, you were one of the people that I that I uh, got to know early on in that journey. And you introduced me to some people that you might not even remember doing. Um, and I, this is what I tell people all the time now, like with LinkedIn, I made this comment yesterday, actually. So, you know, we do the Startup Law Academy that mm -hmm. um, we're probably not gonna have time to talk about it, but, uh, um, I, I was one of the one of the students made this comment that he doesn't like going to like um, cocktail parties, like networking cocktail parties. And I realized that like I never liked it either. I always felt awkward. I was always the guy sort of waiting for someone to come over to me. But with LinkedIn, with with Zoom, it's like it's perfect for people like me and and I think many other people because you can go directly to the one-on-one -on -one conversation without having that awkward, like who's, who's making eye contact with you? Who seems to be avoiding making eye contact with you? Should I get a drink yet? Is it too soon? You know, like with LinkedIn, like find somebody that you're interested in and just reach out and say, Hey, I'd like to get to know more about you. And uh, that's what happened. And I just started to get to know more and more about technology. And I realized that, I could compete like without having a million dollar budget on technology, I could get some basic tools that allow me to provide the same solutions and in many ways, better solutions than what the big firms are offering. Do you have any, what are some tips or advice that you can give to immigration, you know, practitioners uh, in terms of thinking about tech? I mean, because on the one hand, you know, to your point, okay, there are only three providers, but on the, on the other hand, it's a bit easier. I have three to choose from. I don't have a hundred to choose from, but of course the more, so there's a balance between how deep do I want to go into researching all the different types of yeah. tech tools I can provide versus, you know, sort of finding the best thing. So, you know, maybe what are some ways that um, you think people can start approaching this or if they're already using tech, how can they look at their existing tech to see if they need anything more or better? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the first thing that I'll say is that it's a lot easier to build from nothing than it is to remodel. Um, and because when, you know, when I was setting, I, when I was testing out these different platforms, they all offer free trials. So don't forget that, like those, take advantage of that. Um, you know, I, I was like, when am I ever going to have more than 10 clients in my database? Like, I remember at the very beginning, it's like, how do I even test this software out? I had to make up all of these fake accounts and fake email addresses. Um, 
And um, the, the, the key, I think, is you have to identify what is the problem and what is what is it that's going to be required to, to address it. So, uh, sorry, that's a little bit of a vague thing to say, but um, when I started, I was I wanted to basically replicate all of the things that I had done at these bigger law firms. And, um, but what I realized pretty soon was that I didn't need all that. Like the type of clients that I was winning, they didn't necessarily need to have um, uh, automatic emails that tell them the case status. What they were more interested in is the advice, um, getting them to the approval, um, and so, uh, like at the early, early stages of the firm, I, it didn't take me very long to realize that I didn't need automatic form filling software. Like the amount of time that that actually saves is not very much, but if you're doing a thousand of something, that time adds up. If it's your, if you're, if it takes you an extra five minutes to manually populate a form, it's not a big deal if you're only doing five or 10 a month, let's say. Um, so the first thing is, is like, think about what is the most pressing thing that your clients need or that you need to be able to deliver the service. Um, I see people talking all the time now about docket wise. I'm just going to throw out some names. I hope I don't offend some of your listeners. Docket wise, camp legal. Those are the two names that I'm seeing all the time. Now it used to be INS zoom tracker law logics. Now everybody seems to be talking about camp legal and docket wise. Um, and we were, we looked at, we looked at them and we were like, you know, we're doing a lot of O's and H one B's and, the, that software seems to be more geared toward, at least at the time, uh, I know that they continue to develop parts of their tool, but at least at the time, they seem to be geared more toward uh, like individual clients, maybe doing family-based cases. Um, and so they would, have feature, they would have features like text messaging. And I was like, none of my clients really care about that. Why would I care about text messaging, right? So don't just go for what somebody you know is using like think about what it is you need so I'll, I'll just tell you that one of our newer additions to our tech stack is ai law or nutranet and one of the reasons that we went with them is that um they're they have they they had the most out of the box uh questionnaires for employment-based visa categories and the other thing that they are doing and so there's some other people doing this too but they they had like a variation that that we really liked is their ability to to build the supporting document package um packet compilation there's different terms for this um but it doesn't solve everything like the you know so i think you just need to sorry i'm babbling you need to think about what it is what's the problem that you really want to solve yeah, and and I guess uh, it also depends on what kind of work you do. To your point earlier, what what type of visa category you work on, um, yeah. you know, and sort of what are the pain points within that visa category? Is it really robust questionnaires and document uploads, um, or is it really small document document uploads, but it's more extensive form filling and, and things like that? And sort of see what tools do those better. Yeah, and there's by the way, there are still certain types of processes and certain clients that we use more of our own sort of home customized solution. Um, there, there's, there's this great term. I don't know if you've, I don't know if how, how, if you've come across this where with technology, the more automated it is, it seems that it's, it tends to get more and more brittle, brittle or rigid. And what I mean by that is like right before we started this call, I was trying to do a G28. Okay. For those who don't know, G28 is just where I'm saying I represent this client. It's a very simple form. Uh, the tool that I'm using in order to get to the point where I can generate that form, I have to fill out pages and pages of questionnaires. So in one sense, that's good because that, that will then allow the program to generate not just the G28, but a bunch of other forms and documents. But if all I need right now, and I have a call starting in five minutes is a G28, 
that's a really terrible solution for me. And so there's, there's, I, I'm just using that as one example because there are times where the non-automated or less automated but more flexible solution might be better. I love that. And that's something to consider, I think, before people jump into this idea of, you know, get, getting the absolute most automated tool, um, think through. But part of it is also you don't you won't know until you try it. You realize it's too inflexible for you. I um, mean, I think one lesson I think there would be to say uh, is that it's not who, what you choose to use right now it doesn't have to be what you're using in a month or two months. Does that mean that you're going to have to spend a little bit more time playing with these tools and, and finding the best thing for you? Yes, but I think ultimately that's what any one of us do when we're trying to create the most streamlined and sort of efficient process. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to have to recalibrate a little bit, throw one tool out, try another tool. But then eventually the idea is that once you do find the thing that's perfect for you, the automation will more than, you know, or the process efficiency in general um, will more than make up for it. But by the way, just sorry, I'll make a quick point. Like, one of the first things that I bought was an Adobe Pro subscription. And, and a big part of the reason was that initially I just had a co-working space. I didn't even have a co-working office. I just had like the membership where I could go in. And so it was like that. I love this George Clooney movie up in the air where he's like, hope my whole life is in a backpack. That's how I was for a while. And I needed to be able to operate without paper. And so whereas a lot of law firms struggle with like, oh, we're going to go paperless and it's like a year or decade long project to go paperless. I gave myself no other option from the very beginning. It's like I, I don't have the I'm not going to have 50 pounds of paper on my back every day. It's It's got to be paperless from the very beginning. So um, again, to this point, like identify what's your most pressing need and don't necessarily buy something that has a whole bunch of stuff you don't need. Um, I just want to make a, a couple of um, couple of comments here. So Jamie, uh, watching from sunny Mississippi. So hey, Jamie, thank you. Uh, Shiv made a point here earlier of identifying cost of production is very important. And this is kind of what we're talking about here. Um, identifying the cost of producing your legal services uh, is important because that can then help you figure out what tools to use. Um, Elena talking about the same idea. It's usually a challenge for startups to figure out, well, how much does it cost for me to provide the service that I provide? I, I don't know. I haven't done it long enough. Um, and, and, you know, that's okay, right? It's, it's something that you just keep going with. Yeah, the, the, definitely the experience that I had at bigger firms, like it's, I, I learned so much about the operations just by, just by being part of that. Um, we had a conversation what would you say is the number one thing that immigration tech solutions are missing? Yeah, so so Marco asked, what would be what would you say the tech solutions are missing? And maybe there isn't a thing, um, but I think it's an interesting question to think about. Um, if I if I may, I think one potential answer is what are what is something that any particular solution is missing for you? So the point that you made is that you can use one particular technology solution uh, that is perfect for someone else. But then for you, let's say it's not flexible enough. And so to, for you, that thing is missing. And so you need to switch. Um, I don't know if you think there's sort of a general thing that, that that's missing. I feel like we're all trying to continuously move forward as much as possible. Um, so, one thing that's like, I would just say, if you want to get into a fascinating sort of study about this is that philosophically, some programs will allow you to to uh, have bi-directional updates, meaning that if you change something on the form, the immigration form, it will send that update back to the database so that that change then stays part of that person's record in the database for future purposes. Other software takes the position that you should never do that because just because you're changing something on the form doesn't necessarily mean that you wanted that to be made permanently. Um, and it's like, if you, if you, if you ever go on any of these forums where immigration lawyers are talking about tech, it's like, it's like the Hatfields and the McCoys. Like some people are just like, I will never use a software that doesn't have bi-directional updates. And other people are like, I would never do that because I don't want this, the form overriding the database. So there are things like that, that are not necessarily obvious. Um, especially if you haven't had experience working 
with a, with the higher volume, but some of these things could actually like totally mess up your data. Like if, mm -hmm. if, and, and then, and then you're, you're, you know, you're starting over. If I can ask you, um, you know, very quickly, cause I, I know you have to, I know you have to go. Um, can you share a little bit about sort of what you're working on now mm -hmm. and sort of where, where you're moving things along with your firm. And I think especially from a tech immigration tech perspective. Yeah. So, um, immigration tech perspective. I, th I think like where uh, there's the, okay, let me, let me take a glass of water here. Um, the, the first thing is get in touch with what you, what is the service or the population that you want to serve? Um, and so I just found it so rewarding to work with a lot of startup founders who are who are on their immigration journey in the U.S. Um, that it sort of philosophically changed the way the practice is operating from the days before when I was focused mainly on big corporate accounts. We have we have some of both, but it's really like what I would say is that I love the energy of startup founders. There's this optimism and belief that they can really do anything and um so so i would say like like as a firm we're very much focused on making sure that top talent can make those dreams come true and i'm more focused on the tech side of things my partner arthur is more focused on the musician and creative side of things that they have kind of similar categories um i often think that those like entrepreneurs and creative people, their brains actually have a similar way they function. It's like, it's like trying to create something new and having this belief that your creation is the best thing ever. I think there's, there's that commonality. And so, um, you know, I think we're really, I think what we are mainly focused on technology wise are, Solutions that allow allow us to to bring the best lawyer skills um, without having to spend as much time on like some of the some of the more mundane aspects of preparing an application. A lot of it, I think, like we're are the the tools we use to build the supporting evidence packages. I would say is probably our biggest. Um, you know, we, we've made progress, but we're not totally where we want to be. Like we want to be able to, uh, we want to be able to, um, uh, you told me to turn off my notifications and I didn't, um, I have to work on an NIE soon for those who know that, know what that is. Um, so, uh, we really want to be able to have the day where some sort of probably even AI can identify label documents for what they are like if you think about an 01 for example there's um there's eight criteria you have to show at least three of them i mean there are other things you have to do as well and so what happens is clients will give you documents sort of piece by piece but there really is no good solution out there that helps to like not just tag the documents but sort them put them in order cr automatically create divider pages you could apply this in any number of immigration uh, context, like even a marriage-based case, I think the technology that's there by by some of the other companies like uh, Prima Law and Boundless, and um, like they've they've made great strides, but it hasn't really come over to the business side in terms of this ability to know where to put things, how to label it. Uh, one of the things that I really like about AI law is that if somebody if somebody uploads a, a JPEG their software will automatically convert it to a PDF. So when it builds the, when it compiles the package, it's like, I don't have to do that anymore. So sometimes, right. the, sometimes the technology solutions don't have to be, you know, the end goal, like something as small as that is still saving some time. I love it. Um, I, I want to ask you one last question here because I know that you're working on something really exciting. It's your second year doing this. You mentioned it briefly. So I wanted to end on this really sort of, uh, you know, on this note of like this thing that you're building that I think is just absolutely 
amazing. And it goes beyond the immigration law world, your startup law academy or Sula, as you call it. So yeah. can you just share just a brief, briefly what it's about? And then I think we'll, we'll, we'll end there okay. um, to, to let you get back to work. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, I mean, I've, I haven't been brief with any of my answers, but uh, th this came out of like the COVID early days, early times, uh, you know, I was meeting a lot of new people on LinkedIn. Uh, we were all at home, right? So there was like this great opportunity for people to connect with new people across the world virtually. And I started to notice that there were all these law students last spring that were, you know, posting about how their summer internships had been canceled. Um, and, you know, the thing is, is that when you're in law school, the summer internship is, is besides your grades, it's probably the most important thing that's going to determine which firms are going to be interested in hiring you, right? Because like, if you want to get a full-time job with a firm that specializes in trademark, let's say, but your summer internships were doing research on critical race theory, they're probably going to be like, hold on a second, like, how, how, how is that connected? And so, um, uh, we thought initially about just hiring an intern. It's like, oh, we'll help someone by hiring an intern. And um, uh, I, I tell this story a few times. A friend of mine that I've that I've met through through probably through you originally is uh, um, uh, Romish uh, from Badani from Bridge, uh, who's an immigration uh, legal tech um, founder of his own immigration software. And, and he said to me, he's like, Ron, why would you do that for just one? Or I think at that point I said, what about 10? He's like, don't do, don't limit it to 10, just leave it wide open, help as many people as you can. And so we did this last summer for people that couldn't find jobs. That was the original idea. And what we found was that um, there's just really this need for law students to have almost like a laboratory environment to think about how they would create their own business, right? Like, don't just go through the motions, get a job with a big firm and learn things over a period of five to 10 years by observing, like start thinking about these things now because there are gonna be a number of law students that have to start their own firms because they don't find a job. And so like finding a way to help give them some foundational business skills that trust me, it's not, it's not very academic, it's very applied. It's through mainly conversations like this with uh, people that I've come to know. Uh, I think you're up in a few weeks probably. Um, but what was really incredible was we did this program last summer over eight weeks. And the last week, the, the participants did a final project. They had formed groups and they, they presented their ideas on a business that they would create. And they were just so creative and so much more than what I thought they were going to come up with that um, this summer uh, it's we're super busy with with like the day job of the firm but we, we just really felt like we need to offer this again because it's uh, it's it's our way of giving back and and I hope I hope that by talking about it here next year we'll have even more interest in it because I think it's not just an opportunity to learn, but it's an opportunity for law students to expand their own networks. Absolutely. I mean, and, and as somebody who was, you know, I'm really grateful to have been a speaker at one of the sessions. It's really cool to see all these students. And at that point, also, you had recent grads um, just show their enthusiasm for under learning about the law, learning about the business of law. And then of course it was very tech focused. So you had the founder of Clio do a talk. And I mean, there's, there's such an, it was such an incredible opportunity. So I wanted to end on that because I feel like that's, you know, when I think about what you're doing moving forward, I mean, yes, your, your firm is growing and you're constantly, you know, sort of giving back to the immigration law community by talking and sharing, you know, sort of your expertise on technology. But I think you're also giving back a lot to the broader legal community, especially the next generation of lawyers, I think in a way that, you know, maybe to you is yes, it's a summer thing. And it was, but to them, it might be something that they'll never forget, it will be a foundational experience for many of them. And I think that's super cool. So I just wanted to kind of shout that out. Um, so before we go, uh, you know, for folks who, who want to learn a little bit more about the Startup Law Academy, where can they find some more information about that? Of course, I invite everyone to connect with you on LinkedIn and check out your law firm page, matten-law.com. 
Um, but uh, for, for Startup Law Academy, where can they go to find a bit more about that? Um, yeah, so the, the best place is probably following me on LinkedIn, but we do have our own website, startuplawacademy.com. Uh, All together, startuplawacademy.com. Um, it's, uh, it'll give you some sense of, of what the program is and, and what we're doing. Um, you know, truthfully, uh, if you're interested in being a guest speaker or if you think it's something that, that you'd like to contribute to, um, I don't know if, I think our schedule is pretty full already for this summer, but contact me because uh, trust me, the more help we can get, the better. Um, it's, it's something that uh, it, it's just something we're doing to help out. But uh, if you want to be part of it, just let me know. I love it. Well, Ron, thank you so much. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy, busy schedule. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing your your story. It's super cool. And I, I love connecting the dots of like where sort of you came from and, and, and sort of your come up professionally. And then now, not just the way that you're building your firm, but the way you're giving back very much as a teacher, by the way, um, to this sort of next generation of lawyers. So so thank you for what you do. And of course, thank you for for being on the show. Thanks, Roman. I appreciate it. Cool. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate your comments. Um, I know we didn't get to a few of them, but I do, uh, you know, want to make sure that Ron get get back to work. Uh, really cool. Definitely reach out to Ron on LinkedIn and elsewhere, especially if you want to learn more about the Startup Law Academy um, or just chat about any of these deeply philosophical things with regards to, you know, immigration technology and sort of law firm practice management. Um, it's super interesting. And I'm sure that Ron would be more than happy to talk to you about it. I know that I am. Um, and him and I, he and I talk about this all the time. So um, again, thank you all so much for supporting the show and watching and uh, see you next weekend. And in the meantime, peace out and stay safe.